Okay, thank you very much for your presence. It's an honor to have you there as Martin Wolf, that is a well-known and worldwide famous economist. He's the chief economist at Financial Times. Everyone reads Martin every week in the FT. And today we are going to have a very good discussion, we hope, about the future of capitalism. What would I flip? This is about the recent book that Martin launched, The, Cap um, the Crisis of the Democratic Health. I suggest everyone to read this book. It's a fantastic book with uh, very good insights about the future of our democracy and our society. And uh, our idea is to have a conversation within three parts. So, uh, the first part, as we spoke, it's about democracy and capitalism. The second, about the erosion of trust and the civil society participation. And finally, where are we going in the future? Martin will speak a little bit in the each point, and then we'll have a discussion with people that I will invite to speak. Martin, please, thank you very much. Okay, so this will be relatively informal. I'll just uh, uh, um, set out some ideas, and perhaps in each case, perhaps five or 10 minutes, and then we can have a discussion of some of what I say. I hope that will uh, do. So let me start though by saying, why I decided to write this book, um, because it's not really in my normal area of focus. I generally focus <clears throat> on economics, not politics. Um, but I started for pretty obvious reasons in 2016, um, uh, because it seemed to me obvious that not only were there some very big changes in politics worldwide, with the rise of authoritarian, authoritarianism in many developing countries <coughs> and the rising power of China, uh, but also that there were very big developments going on within core democratic countries, and notably ones I know best, uh, the English-speaking countries, the United States and the United Kingdom, with the... Um, ultimately the election of Donald Trump as president and the um, uh, and the Brexit campaign, um, the successful Brexit campaign. And it was obvious that both of these <laughs> reflected and all of them to some extent reflected an upsurge of a certain sort of populism. Um, and that um, populism, and this will go to our second area of discussion, reflects, in my view, in very significant ways, a collapse in trust between large sections of our populations um, and ruling elites. Uh, and these elites in our societies, of course, very complicated. So they include ac intellectual, ac uh, intellectual academic uh, uh, elites, bureaucratic elites, political elites, uh, business elites. Um, and probably others I've missed out. So, and the, the focus of these um, dissensions varies across countries, but it's clearly an anti-elite movement. And in some ways, and I'll come to this later, an anti-pluralist movement, namely an attempt to go back to a vision of society, which is of a, a of a society which is very very different from the one that has evolved over the last half century, in terms of its diversity, both cultural and ethnic, and also um, its globalism, its in international integration. It's a backlash against that too. So that then leads that with that little opening remark about why I started writing this book. Let me say a little bit about the sort of two main points about uh, um, democratic capitalism. So um, the first is what it is, how it evolved, and second, um, exactly why, why people now talk about something called the democratic recession. So on the first, um, as I note in my book, though there have been efforts in the past um, at democracy, most famously, I suppose, for us Westerners in Athens in the fifth century BC, um, we can say that on almost any standard definition of democracy, 
five, uh, 200 years ago, there were no democracies anywhere. Uh, there were representative political institutions, but not democracies. And I argued in my book that um, the rise of democratic ideas, very slow, very complex, with much, many struggles, um, occurred over the succeeding few hundred years, uh, but in substantial parts of what we now call the developed countries in Europe and um, uh, uh, abroad, um, uh, in by um, the middle of the 20th century, democratic institutions have become reasonably well established in many. So we had universal suffrage democracies um, in the US, in the UK, in much of Western Europe after the Second World War, um, and uh, again in quite a few uh, uh, emerging and developing countries. Um, all this is clear. So the question obviously arises: why suddenly did these democratic institutions emerge and how do they relate to the birth of the market economy as a, as a driving force? And my argument very briefly is that they share some common roots and they are what we would call in England and I suspect where you are in Portugal too liberal in the sense that the assumptions that they share are that individuals are entitled to make their own choices and achieve their own successes in life that we don't live in a society and shouldn't live in a society of ascribed status, of permanently ascribed yes. status. That's that well. people are entitled to work hard, create their own businesses within the law, uh, operating legally to create prosperity for themselves and for others and in the process transform economies. And this set of ideas, what you might call the early capitalist ideas, ultimately unleashed an extraordinary economic upsurge, you think of as the Industrial Revolution and what followed it, and that completely transformed our societies, making them urban, industrial, and very, very significantly much more educated than societies had ever been before, much more generally educated. Universal literacy became a norm because it was part of economic progress. And I argue that these processes, along with quite a few others I don't have time to discuss, led to the demand for political inclusion. And ultimately, the various elites of those societies 100, 120 years ago, 150 years ago, and more recently decided that suppression of these forces was going to be costly, disruptive, painful and futile, and it would be far better to include everybody within the political system in a democratic framework. So what emerged is what I call democratic capitalism. And this, of course, is far too brief. I don't discuss the huge breakdowns in the interwar Europe, the rise of the great dictatorships and all the rest of it. Uh, but in the end, the democracies won in the West, at least, though very, very clearly not in the world as a whole. Over the last um, 15, 20 years, however, um, we are increasingly seeing what one very distinguished scholar calls a democratic recession, a rollback of uh, of. Uh, uh, of this form of the legitimacy of the society that has emerged. And I argue in my book that this is predominantly, at least in the West, driven by economic forces, though cultural aspects of it are increasingly significant, are in clearly very significant. And in particular, uh, in some of the most important advanced economies, US, UK particularly, um, people don't really feel that they're sharing equally in the benefits of economic growth and growth itself has significantly slowed. All this got immensely much worse after the financial crisis, which was a devastating shock 
to the credibility of the people running the system because it was such an obvious indicator of failure. And the, uh, this, uh, this um, then has led to increasing breakdown of confidence in the ruling elites and with it an increasing search for on the one hand scapegoats and in the other leaders who will promise them to act against these elites elites and these this sort of anti-elite political leadership is i argue in my book the defining characteristic of populism what we call populism the one thing that all populist leaders have shared throughout history is the attempt to mobilize the people uh, at large, the plebeians, however you define it, against uh, those perceived as hostile, indifferent, or predatory elites of many different kinds. And that, I argue, is where we are. And the interesting feature of the current bunch of populists is they're mostly on the right, not on the left. Left-wing populism seems generally very weak at the moment, and I think it's very interesting to consider why. And the right, the ones on the right tend to be nationalist, somewhat authoritarian, xenophobic, uh, um, hostile to some of the extensions of rights we've seen in the recent past, to minorities, to women and other uh, groups, and their leaders, to some extent, reflect this. So this is, I think, incredibly briefly, um, a summation of what the okay. analysis of where we are. So the first part was about this idea of uh, democratic capitalism, and I think we have some people that want to make questions. Uh, to make some comments, I don't know. Antonetta Silva, <laughs> it's the first time you are here with us. You are also a person that is usually committed to this topic. Do you want to make some comments, some question to Martin, please? We are not listening to you. You have to put the sound, the sound. Antonio, we are not listening to you. You must put the sound, sir. Hmm. Okay. Okay, now. Um, well, I have something dancing on my mind, and, and the, my question is, um, when I observed these, these last year's democracy, <clears throat> I just wonder whether we were not excessively um, tolerant, and uh, until what point excessive tolerance will not destroy democracy? If you, Martin, could comment on this, I would be grateful. But you can put three questions, Martin. We don't mind. It's better to, to put three questions. The Paul Simons, do you want to make any question to Martin? Paul Simons, are you listening now? I am. Yes, please. I am. I'm listening. And uh, and Martin, thank you very much for uh, thank you very much for this very brief introduction. So I I tend to define democracy in the way that we usually use the word as liberal and representative. So I think that we should not use just the word democracy. It should be liberal representative democracy. And it comes from the Greeks, as you were saying. So my question, my question to you is, where, where is it eroding the democracy? Is it on the representative side? Is it on the liberal side? Where is it eroding? Why is it? Why is it eroding? So I'm, I'm trying to get the root cause here. Okay. I don't know if Bez McCrime that is also with, with us. Bez, but do you want to make a question to, to Martin? Um, thanks, James. Thanks, Martin. I think I joined slightly uh, late, so I would like to pass today. Thank you. Okay. You ask later on. Okay. So, and Karina, do you want to make a question to Martin before he answers? To have you, uh, someone from the Hello, opposite Hello. side. Hello, uh, I was just wondering when you said that uh, uh, I'm not a nationalist, I'm not a populist, but somehow uh, we feel that there are some answers that uh, the citizens um, feel that our elites fail to us. So without 
uh, falling into populism or into nationalism or into these extremists? How can normal citizens regain confidence, confidence in the system? Okay, so Martin, if you want to answer to this first three questions, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, all interesting questions. And of course, my um, description of what I argue about is, was my discussion was unbelievably brief, so I couldn't go into much of this in detail. On the first question, um, on excessive tolerance, obviously, I can't really respond to this question in a way because the question is, what tolerance is excessive? So I, my general answer to this is something like this. A, a democratic society, which is also necessarily a liberal one in the sense that everybody is in principle entitled to participate in public life, to put him or herself forward in public life and to argue for their positions and their opinions. That's, I think, a sort of pretty fundamental characteristic of a democratic society and always has been going back to the Greeks. Um, is a society in which inevitably you have to tolerate opinions that you don't agree with. Otherwise, it's not a democracy, it's something else. So toleration is an inherent part of the system. You have to tolerate mobilization by people you violently disagree with. You have to tolerate opinions you violently disagree with. And probably inevitably, since people differ so much in what they believe is important to them, you will also have to tolerate behavior you disagree with. So toleration is in some sense uh, an inescapable part of living in a democracy. And certainly one is the second um, uh, interlocutor to say it, a liberal one, which is certainly what I mean by this. Now, the question is, what is excessive tolerance? And I think this can be defined in a number of different ways, and I don't know exactly what was meant. But first of all, there might be people who wish in their public life to subvert democracy. They wish to overthrow the democratic order. And there's very, very clear examples of people operating recently in democracy, some of them very, very important people, like the former president of the United States, who wanted to overthrow the electoral, electoral process. That's pretty clear, about as clear as anything can be. And I don't think that can be tolerated, because without, if you tolerate that, you don't have a democracy anymore, the, it becomes something else, an autocracy. So you can't tolerate more broadly political forces that wish to overthrow the system as a whole. This is always the limits of liberalism. Then you get to the question of, can you tolerate people whose behavior you find morally abhorrent? How far do you need a shared moral set of moral values beyond the core ones, which are obvious toleration, um, the avoidance of criminality and corruption yes, yes, yes. that are obviously poisonous for a state. Mm -hmm. I, my own view on this is pretty liberal. That is to say, there are core values that we have to share if we're going to have a democracy. One among them, respect for the opinions and value of others. Um, but I personally believe that in a liberal society, we have to expect that people have quite different values on things that concern them personally. And I believe that we are required to tolerate them in order that we can live together. Uh, so liberal democracies tend to generate over time a far wider range of personal values than more traditional hierarchical societies. Uh, and that I think is inevitable. The question whether, the, when and whether that gets to the point where they can't live together anymore, the differences are so profound, 
that you no longer can share a political community? That's, I think, a really big and profound question. It's obviously arises now in the US. And there are other countries I can see this arising. So one of the classic foundations of liberal democracy has been religious tolerance. And um, that can become quite difficult. And we can see how difficult it is in quite a number of places right now. But broadly speaking, I tend to the view that provided you don't tolerate anti-democratic, profoundly anti-democratic and illiberal sentiment, you have to live with it. Um, so, but maybe I misunderstand the, the thrust of the question. That's my answer. On what I mean by democratic and democracy and what is being undermined, uh, I clearly mean liberal and I mean representative, though less the latter than the former. By the way, of course, as you know very well from your question, the Athenians had a sort of liberal democracy, but they didn't have a representative one. It was direct democracy. And the, and the I mean, the decisions were taken by the votes of all citizens. And if you look at Switzerland, is the country that comes closest to that now, though they do have other forms of democracy. And I think one of the really big questions, which I discuss in my book, whether given current technologies, exactly. uh, so let me just sort of finish that. I mean, it's an important point. We move to, let me just make this one point and then I'll go, there are so many other aspects of this deep question. Representative democracy, that is to say, parliamentary democracy, uh, in which people selected representatives who were their legislators in parliament, originated in the Middle Ages in Europe. The English would claim that they originated in the 13th century in England. I'm not going to insist on that, but it's clearly the idea of parliament or parlement in French, and I think you have similar institutions in the Iberian Peninsula, uh, um, is old. Um, and it's a was a big change. It created a sort of elected oligarchy. And the crucial thing is that until the 19th century, the constituencies were very narrow. The, the, the people who were represented who, people who chose representatives were rather a limited group. The big change in the 19th and early 20th century was the move to universal suffrage and therefore universal representation. But I think it's a legitimate question, which I only discuss in passing, whether given current technology, that's the last word. Maybe we should have more direct democracy, though I've found the recent use of referenda Pretty, tech, pretty scary. Maybe we could consider, and I discuss this in my book, having some political institutions selected by lot, bringing ordinary people back into the legislative process. But it's clear I am referring to representative democracy because that's the canonical form for large countries. And it is the form that allowed really large countries for the first time not to be centralized monarchies or similar or empires. Now, the liberal side is pretty fundamental, more fundamental than that, which is the essential quality of any democracy, and I've already hinted in that, is you can have political debate and political argument, uh, quite strong disagreement. You can mobilize support and funding for, for parties with very different views, and they must be allowed to campaign, to argue, to a dispute to appear in uh, on public media and all the rest of it. And all this, if you like, is a definition of liberalism. Um, liberalism may be defined as the acceptance of wide range of different opinions in the political sphere and social sphere. And it is clearly precisely what the great authoritarians in the past and in our current time, the Chinese regime, the Russian regime, most obviously, but many others are opposed to. So democracy is liberal in my view, or it's nothing. Now, if it's going to be a liberal democracy, and this is crucial, that implies there have to be rules of the game that everybody accepts and that are enforced. 
those rules of the game are established most powerfully in three ways. In public opinion, the acceptance of the legitimacy of this is crucial. In the rule of law, uh, which guarantees independence and autonomy for political and so economic actors, because you need resources to conduct politics. And, and, uh, and of course, above all, the rules of the game are crucial in the whole electoral process. Uh, you, you must agree and abide by a process of counting which decides who in any particular case is won. And all these, these rules of the game are the core of it. And of course, it is the rules of the game that are usually subverted by people who wish to transform the democracy from within into an autocracy. And we've seen that in many examples, essentially the, the leader, elected leader, claims that he or she has the right to change the legal system so that the lawyers, the judges are, lo are loyal to him rather than the state as a whole change the media so that they are loyal to him and not to the wider public as a whole, change the election laws so that uh, he wins whatever happens, as it were, and that's how autocracy replaces democracy. And in our time, interestingly, most subversion of democracy occurs from within in this way, not by coups, not by military takeovers in the current circumstance, it's this transformation which Viktor Orban once defined <clears throat> so beautifully as illiberal democracy, it ends up killing democracy. So we can safely say without liberal democracy, without liberalism, we have no democracy. I think these are twins, uh, Siamese twins. Finally, sorry about the length of this reply, how do normal citizens regain confidence uh, uh, in the process? I think this is a very very profound question, and it's probably the biggest question. I argue in my book, I hope I'm right, because if, if, if I'm wrong, the we're in much more trouble even than I think, that a great deal of the reason people have become so disenchanted with our democratic political system is that in many countries, they feel that they have been ignored, that their lives haven't got better, that there is a great deal of corruption at the top of various kinds which is never redressed or addressed and that the political system as a whole is essentially indifferent to them or even worse led by people who despise them and i think the reaction we are seeing is in part a reflection of those uh, attitudes and I argue in my book, at great length, perhaps excessive length, there are pretty good reasons for people to believe these things because the experience they have over a long period has not been particularly favorable to them. I believe and argue that the populist leaders we've had have almost without exception been incompetent and indifferent and corrupt and have played, done actually nothing to improve the situation objectively of the people who support them, or many of the people who support them. But there's no doubt they feed on this sense of the hostility of many elites to them and the indifference. And so my argument in the book is the only answer to that is to have politicians who are prepared to work more effectively, more plausibly, more credibly for the people as a whole. Now, I have a great deal of discussion of the policies that might imply, but I am, thank God, not a politician. I uh, have no talent in that direction, and I don't know where these leaders are going to come from. But the big point I would make, which I think is quite made in the book, is we shouldn't be complacent about the extent to which many ordinary people, quite obviously in many countries, have become disenchanted with what they see as a closed circle of policymakers and business people and intellectuals who do not represent them and do are not interested in them. And once that happens, democracy is likely to corrode. So I have a big discussion of that, 
whether I have any good answers, I think that's a very good mm -hmm. question because I'm much better, I'm afraid, at analysis than solutions. <clears throat> but I think it's, it is a, is a core question. And if we focus on that question, ask ourselves every day, I try to, what are we doing that will make our citizens feel that they are part of something that cares about them, then I think we will do better. Okay, Matt. Perfect. I think it will be better because we are in a bit of time. To summarize the next two points in one, also, what is the future and what will be the role of civil society? And we then have some more questions, okay? Thank you. So what is the future is, I think, um, the biggest question. And um, I think that I will approach that in a slightly different way. Uh, but it is also my book. Um, the future will be decided uh, in, in, first of all, a picture of go. Obviously, the future is inherently and enormously uncertain and unknown. Um, so I, that goes without exception. Things are happening all the time we didn't expect. The, the uh, second point is Part of what will determine the future is what happens to the democracies themselves, which are now quite embattled. And I can't really predict political outcomes, but there are electoral processes over the next five, 10 years that are likely to have very large effect on the way the core democracies are able to behave and function. I mean, in my view, the re-election of Donald Trump as president of the United States would have a very profound impact on its future and behavior. And that would clearly be very, very important. I don't think the British launch of populism is very significant. Uh, so I'm quite optimistic of that. I am genuinely interested, but not confident that I know the answer to the question, what would happen to France and Europe if Marine Le Pen became, becomes the next president of France? as most of my French friends, elite French friends, believe will be the case. And that's a huge sort of question mark. But there are two other really big, or perhaps three other really big questions about where we're headed in the future. The first, and I wrote about that this week, is obvious is a big part of my book towards the end, is our relations with the autocracy, with the, the great autocracies and above all with China. And the rise of China is the biggest fact geopolitically and geoeconomically of our, my lifetime. And it's, there's no doubt it has changed the world. The emerging alliance, whatever you call it, friendship, uh, partnership between Russia and China is an enormously important fact. They're their ability together, but particularly China, to exert influence across the world uh, through money and through trade in the Middle East, in Africa, in South America is colossal. And for this is a complete transformation of the world away from what has essentially been very broadly speaking, a Eurocentric world over the last few centuries. And I think we are struggling, profoundly struggling in deciding how to deal with this. And there are many possible outcomes, including war, uh, as I discussed. I think it's, it's pretty clear. And beyond that, there are big things going on in the world system with, uh, potentially unknown effects, uh, but potentially very dramatic effects of these, of most of us would think the global environment, climate and all the rest of it are crucial, but also more broadly, the success of developing countries and continuing to develop or their, the possibility that some of them will collapse economically and politically, the spread of nuclear weapons, which I expect to accelerate. There are many, many huge challenges. And finally, in thinking about all this, uh, these things together, there's a very profound question about the future of our global economy. How does that work? How do, are we going to, can, you know, sort of 
we are in a deglobalizing era that's very significant, particularly for Europeans. But how far that deglobalization will go, what its nature is, is and so forth, will clearly be driven by the way what I talked about and these processes that I've just talked about interact. And though I discussed that in my book and some of my columns, there are just giant uncertainties. Now, finally, civil society. Well, in our society, civil society really matters. Uh, the that's one of the great things about liberal democracies, why I like it. Uh, we are entitled all to act and associations have shaped our world, often associations of outsiders. Um, and I, one of the point I make in my book, I don't know whether this is in any way relevant to Portugal's history, but certainly in Britain and America and many other Northern European countries, Trades unions, which emerged in the 19th and early 20th centuries, were immensely powerful political access. Among other things, they created the social democratic parties, which shaped in a significant measure the, the compromise between capitalism and democracy that characterized the European countries in particular. So civil associations of this kind, throughout the history of the U US and UK and other liberal countries, civil associations, a very wide range, have played a hugely important role in the formation of political and social movements. Now, the point I would make here is there's a lot of evidence that many of the civil associations, including political parties themselves, have ossified, that they are uh, becoming detached from their base as they become more professionalized, and of course, the transformation in media, the arrival of social media that, um, and the atomization of publics that have gone along with that and the loss of very often of a shared set of understandings of the world which have gone along with that have made both the formation of civil societies and their cohesion within the broader framework of democracy far more difficult. To put it bluntly, uh, it seems to me that our civil society is less of a society, more individual, individual and worse, it, ha it is characterized by far deeper rifts of understanding, comprehension and agreement than we've been used to at least since the Second World War, though it does have echoes, very strong echoes of the late 19th the first half of the 20th century when civil society was also almost completely fractured. I feel that this is an incredibly important area, which I discuss briefly in my book. It's not an area of expertise, but it is an area of concern. And there are quite a number of concerns because without an active civil society, the ability of people to act together, not just individually, society inevitably fractures into a small elite who decide everything and a, and a vast society of people who feel they are and indeed are outside all the processes of power. Okay, Martin, so let's go now for the final set of questions. We have here in the chat some questions. I ask Jean Rodis, do you want to make your question directly, very briefly, please? Hello, uh, everybody. Uh, thanks, Martin, for your time. My question is regarding the importance of the media, especially, I believe it's the same situation in your country. In Portugal, we have several uh, TV channels communicating 24 uh, hours a day, and everybody is aware that it get more attention when you are communicating a negative side. So to summarize my point, I do believe that over communication is generating a kind of a sense of toxicity in the, the societies, which will put in cause trust, it will put in cause the confidence that we should have in the decisions in the government. So, what is your vision about that? Thanks. Okay. Jean Luis Roseda, you have also one question. Do you want to put it to Martin, please? João, did you listen, please? Yeah, thank you. The, the question that I put uh, is, not, uh, it's, um, it's why uh, in this moment, uh, the, the centers of power 
are uh, uh, not representative. Um, the, uh, I think that uh, perhaps I would like to know what you think about. It's uh, the, the world's lords are very well represented in the centers of power. Um, so what do you think about that? Okay. Luis Neves, you are organizing a very interesting event on the role of society, especially in terms of the digital. Do you want to make a, a question to Martin, please? Well, thank you, Jaime. Uh, well, Martin said many things which I agree with. Um, I was only wondering, Martin, uh, about the extent to which, in your analysis, um, the issue around the digital divide that has been created in the last couple of years and the erosion of ethics uh, really led to, 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 to this crisis of democratic capitalism. And when it comes to the future, I would like to understand how, how do you see things moving in a context whereby you now the speed of artificial intelligence uh, is leading us to a, a, a new uh, world uh, that we do not understand. But more importantly, I see a disconnect uh, between what is evolving from a, um, let's say, a knowledge perspective and the capacity of policymakers to understand what, what's going on. So how are we regulating this? What kind of people do we need uh, to really ensure that we'll be living in a, in a sustainable world and in a democratic society in the future? Okay, and to finalize, one woman, I don't know, Philippe Fish, do you want to make any comment or question to Martin? Philippe, I, I don't know if you are listening. Ana Paula Reis está a pedir a palavra. Yes, yes, please. Ana Paula, I Hi. was asking you. Okay, please, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, uh, what's your perspective on the on India? So where does it stand in this uh, global view? Considering that uh, what, what we can see now is not the rise of one new power, but the rise or the potential rise of two powers. Uh, adding the fact that India is shifting from being a democracy into a uh, more of a dictatorship sort of state. Uh, and also, uh, the fact that India has all over the world a big representation across big CEOs. I mean, not only in the US, but in, in Europe and in, in, in the uh, areas where technology is uh, so important. So where does India stand? Thank you. Okay. Besma, I think you want also to make a question. And this is the final one. Besma. Uh, thank you. Well. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jane. Thank you. Uh, just just a fast question. Uh, um, actually, uh, one of the things that Dr. Martin mentioned is the need for the public debate in order to inform people so that they are, they can make a decision, and and then we can have a, a real representation. With the with the fake news, with the fact that people are consuming more of these uh, news snippets, and uh, very few people are actually reading articles or listening to debates end to end. How do you see technology is helping? Um, or actually uh, making it more difficult to have uh, public debates and to have detailed debates. Uh, and what can we do? And especially with the with the uh, uh, with the AI now and with the possibility to have even more fake news. So I think we can be more concerned. I would love to hear your 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 opinion about that. Okay. So Martin, we have a lot of questions, and with that, we will finalize. Okay. Thank you. Well, they're wonderful questions, and and I define a wonderful question as one I can't answer. So, <laughs> the, uh, of which there are many. Uh, since I'm not a politician, I'm very happy to accept there are lots of things I can't answer. I think quite a number of them are in different ways about the media uh, and its role. Um, fake news, uh, twenty-four hour a day media the loss of trust in media, the digital divide. Um, uh, and then there's AI as part of that and also something in itself. Uh, so let me just address that. Uh, I thought about this and it's part of my book, but I think now it's probably not the entirely satisfactory part, probably because I would have had to write a whole new book. 
uh, and uh, and I do cover a lot of ground already. So I argue in my book that I'm inclined to the view that uh, we may be overplaying the role of media in the obvious disarray that we are seeing. And I point out in particular that populist movements, uh, um, the emergence of dictatorships within democracies being elected, gaining support and being elected, the um, uh, authoritarian and reactionary political movements, and indeed highly uh, uh, destabilizing revolutionary movements have all characterized our societies in the last hundred years or so, long before all these new media came along. So um, I'm sort of inclined to think that once we had the printing press and radio and television, I'll come to television in a moment, we already had created very, very powerful engines of change. And I would still take the view, by the way, that the, whoever thought, and surely many must have thought in the 15th century, that the printing press was the engine of the devil and would end civilization was from their point of view, clearly completely correct. So I still take the view that the printing press is probably the most important communications technology we've ever created. Nonetheless, it is clear that we something quite important has happened in the last 40 years, 30, 30 years, particularly since the internet, which is radio and television, and to a lesser degree, the printing press, um, what, it was possible to centralize them and bring them under the control of one state organization. And the characteristic of the new media is that it's basically impossible to do so. So um, we could relatively easily suppress the Fox News of this world, the television stations. That's a, that was a political choice to allow media to emerge in America, which had absolutely no guardrails, was a political choice under Reagan. And that could be reversed. I mean, I'm not saying it will be, but it could be reversed. It's a political choice. But with the uh, social media, you've got something else going on. And it clearly is, as I describe in the book, a remarkable engine for the costless dissemination of non-information or anti-information. And I think the honest truth is we don't know how to control this. We don't know how to control this, and it's getting worse. Um, what I'm not completely sure about, and I'd say this with real humility, is I don't know quite how important it is. Because it seems to me in countries which still have some authoritative channels of communication, public broadcasters that are expected, uh, that uh, newspapers that are respected, the role of social media, though undoubtedly important, is not totally destructive of political processes and political arguments. But I may be too, being too naive. There's no doubt in this context that AI's capacity to multiply immensely the production of fake stuff already incredibly advanced may turn out to be infinitely more corrosive than I imagine. One might also hypothesize more optimistically that a society gets used to these new technologies as it has in the past, it will find a way of bringing them under control but i honestly don't know i don't know how that will happen so that that's the digital media thing but i certainly don't have any good answers except my, my view the case for su supporting public service media has become much stronger not weaker in the current uh, current world more broadly about ai I think I'm at the stage of most other people, I've read a lot about it, I've talked to people, of not knowing how profoundly AI will transform 
the uh, the economies of our society. I've already talked about information and uh, how radical its impact will be on employment and so forth. Uh, my guess is it will be quite significant, but it won't actually be as radical as some of the technological transformations we've already gone through. I am uh, known for my provocative view that the technological transformations of our era, though very important, significant and challenging, are actually significantly smaller than the technological changes that occurred in, our, in the times of our grandparents, great-grandparents and great-great-parents. I won't go further into that because I don't have uh, the time. What is crucial in both these areas is how we regain some sense of authority. And I think that's partly education, so people actually learn, and it's a very important part of education in schools and universities, what authoritative sources are not, what authoritative processes are for gaining information and what are not, and that there exist institutions which are state-supported that provide authoritative comment uh, and news, information, statistical offices and all the rest of it. Whether that will work, I have no idea. Um, why are sentences of power not representative was one question. Well, my view is they never are. Um, almost by definition, sentences of power are not representative. But I think a lot of this has to do with whether political parties are still functional institutions. And we can't operate it's not a subject I discuss adequately in my book. We, we don't know how to run representative governments without parties. It's not been possible to find any other way. And political parties, I think, have tended to ossify and fail because most of them now have tiny memberships and are not connected to a broad part of the public. And that has to do with the atomization of our society and of, the, and of civil society uh, groups which were often very closely connected with parties and that's really worrying to me and I don't know how to do anything about it so yet another area that you can all solve for me <clears throat> and for yourselves and finally India in the last three minutes um happily in hey, Martin, sorry uh, besides India we have a question about Islam I I forgot to see it how do you think Islam can be a problem to Western society. What do you think about that? Okay. You may speak uh, about India and Islam. Oh, okay. okay, India and Islam in, in yes. three minutes. Well, that's pretty absurd. That's, okay. only, that's only about three billion people. Uh, so um, uh, I followed India, so I'm mostly India. I followed India for most of my professional life. I was the World Bank senior economist on India in the 70s. And I, my first book was on India. So it's a fascinating country. Um, so first, it's becoming an illiberal democracy. I think that's the best way of defining it. <clears throat> um, Modi is an immensely effective political leader and demagogue, and I assume he will remain in power for uh, the indefinite future. How I would say he is a moderately effective ruler of India from the economic point of view, and I believe that under him, the underlying trend growth of India has fallen rather than risen. Um, I believe that that trend growth is somewhere around four or five percent a year. So it's completely different in the rapidity of growth, quite different order almost from China in, when it was really exploding. But it will probably be the fastest growing large economy in the world. Nonetheless, it's a nuclear power. So it's a very big country. So the way I think we should think about India, it, was, it will pursue its own interests. It will be our ally in some areas, particularly against China, because it really worries about China much more than any of us. It has a border and it's a contested border. Um, so it will be an ally. It will not be an ally of ours against Russia. That's, it will pursue its own line. It will, uh, I think, on the whole, be a stabilizing force than a, rather than a destabilizing one because it wants a stable world in which to grow. It will, by 2040, probably be, as a national economy, I don't consider the EU as a whole, the third largest country, economy in the world ahead of Japan. I think it's almost certain. Uh, it will be the world's most populous country, but it won't be a superpower. It won't compare in its weight to the US or China. 
uh, which will be substantially bigger. So it's a, going to be a very important player, important market, very significant international links, real talent in international in IT. Uh, it's done some remarkable things, a very important country, but not, I think, comparable to the US or China. But that will be my guess. And I think in many areas will be a useful ally. I have nothing really useful to say about Islam, uh, except I am rather optimistic about the possibility that Muslims in our countries will become um, completely happy, productive citizens. Uh, that's very much my ex our experience in Britain. I, uh, somebody pointed out recently that in Britain we now have a Hindu prime minister and uh, a Muslim mayor of London and, and a premier of Scotland. And this really isn't an issue. It just isn't an issue. I've, this is the most single most cheering thing that has happened to me uh, in the last five years, that that was possible. Uh, they may be good or bad, some of them, are bad, but I think they basically rather like living in liberal societies. And I have this probably unbelievably naive optimism that, that, that they will develop living in liberal democracies, a form of Islam, which takes account of the modern world, adjusts to the modern world, and will, to some degree at least, influence Islam in Islamic countries themselves. I hope that will be the case, even though the numbers, of course, are very adverse. Uh, in the same way, I think that Indians in America influence India. So I'm not, I don't, I've never believed in the great war of us against Islam. And I and of course I and I think it's in any case incredibly smismatic. Uh, I don't believe there is such a coherent force, and we mustn't frame our disputes in that broad war of religion framework, which I think is unbelievably unproductive and destructive. Uh, um, and so I'm a modest optimist on this. I may be completely wrong. Uh, and I think many in the Islamic world that I know, of course, tiny elite members, feel that 9-11 and everything that followed this was a catastrophic mistake and should never have happened. So I'm moderately optimistic on this. Someone has to be optimistic about something, doesn't one? Martin, with this uh, optimism, we thank you very much for this hour. It was fantastic. Thank you very much, okay? It was very good. And I hope that everyone can read the book. I suggest reading the book. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. I okay? should say, nice by week. the way, that there, I don't know whether it's of any interest to you, there is not going to be a Portuguese Portuguese edition, but there is going to be a Brazilian Portuguese edition. Oh, okay. So I don't know whether this matters to any of you since you all know English so well, but okay. no, that will no, emerge. Portuguese. Sorry? No, 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 that, that, that's okay. Yes, <laughs> sorry, please, sorry, sorry. <laughs> We prefer English to Brazilian Portuguese. I, mean, I was arguing. I know that there is this terrible division between Portuguese Portuguese and Brazilian Portuguese. I don't know enough about it. We are quite happy with in, uh, American English, even though we don't really think it's English. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Mike. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay. Bye bye. A great pleasure as always again. Thank, thank you. you. Very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.